He who is your Lord, the all merciful, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding the entire human race as one soul and one body. Baha'u'llah. They whose hearts are warmed by the energizing influence of God's creative love cherish his creatures for his sake and recognize in every human face a sign of his reflected glory. Shoghi Fenton. So today we're really happy to have Mr. Masood Olufani, and his topic is Tell Them We Are Rising, Robert Turner, the first African-American Baha'i. Masood Olufani is an Atlanta-based multidisciplinary artist born in Los Angeles and raised in New York City, New Orleans, Miami, Dallas, and Atlanta. He's a graduate of Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design, where he earned an MFA in sculpture in 2013. Masood has exhibited his work in group and solo shows nationally and internationally. He's the 2021 to 22 inaugural visual arts fellow at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he's completed residencies at the Vermont Studio Center, the Hambridge Center for Arts and Sciences, and Creative Currents in Portobello, Panama. He's a 2017 Southern Arts Prize State Fellow, a recipient of a 2015 and 2018 IDEA Capital Grant, a Southwest Airlines Art and Social Engagement Grant, and a recipient of the 2015 to 16 MOCA GA Working Artist Project Grant. He's the creative director of Blocked, a global healing project, a multimedia performance created to memorialize spaces marked by the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. As an actor, he's had a recurring role on the BET series, The Quad, and he's appeared in numerous television shows, including Greenleaf, Being Mary Jane, Devious Maids, Satisfaction, and Nashville. He's a featured actor in the film biopic, All Eyes on Me. He was a co-host of the PBS news-based investigative journalism show, Retro Report, which aired nationally in 2019. He's the co-host of Undaunted, a new podcast series that centers the work of social change makers. As a writer, Masood has published articles for Burnaway, Baha'i Teachings, and is a featured contributor for the Jacob Lawrence Struggle Series catalog, produced to coincide with the major exhibition of the Struggle Series paintings. And his untitled memoir is currently in development. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Lufani. Hello, hello. Um, how are you doing? It's so good to uh, to be here in this space with everybody. Um, thank you for those beautiful prayers um, and also the uh, the music piece that was shared in the beginning. The song is really, really beautiful. A nice way to kind of uh, set the stage and uh, for us to kind of enter into this space. I I, I have to be honest. When I do these um, talks, and you know, it's it's always an honor for somebody to ask you to talk about anything. And the people are um, even marginally interested in listening to what you have to say. Um, I, you know, when I when I do these kind of conversations, I view them as conversations. Um, I may share something based on my perspective and my understanding. Of course, there's nothing authoritative about what I share. It really is my understanding um, of a particular subject or my life as a Baha'i um, through my own experience. So I just want to be clear about that. And I also learn a lot uh, through the the process of uh, question and answers. So uh, I view myself really as uh, whenever I'm, um, I'm doing these, sharing space with, uh, with friends and family and uh, having some discussion and some dialogue and some sharing and, uh, and learning and growing. So uh, that's what I like to do. Um, I was, you know, uh, when I was approached about doing this conversation, um, you know, this, this talk and sharing uh, the issue of, uh, or the personage of Robert Turner came up. And um, I was fortunately, I was fortunate recently to be able to participate uh, in the designing of a memorial for um, Robert Turner. Robert Turner, uh, for those of you who uh, may be new to the Baha'i community, who um, are attending uh, this, maybe your first, your second, or your third talk, and the name Robert Turner might not mean anything uh, for you, but um, amongst the Baha'i community, he um, is and was a giant. He is the first African-American uh, believer in the Baha'i faith. And as such, he um, occupies a seminal space within the community. Uh, so, and he was also quite a, a, a humble man. He, he occupied a humble place in terms of his material well-being and, um, and possessions. But nevertheless, his quality, his character, his spirit uh, set him apart. So what I'd like to do is um, I prepared a few slides just to give you guys uh, some context um, and also to kind of highlight some of the major points of Robert Turner's uh, life 
hopefully this will be informative. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the designing of, uh, of the memorial and that whole process. Also, there are elements um, that, uh, in terms of Robert Turner's life, that I feel closely associated with, um, in particular, based on my recent travels to West Africa, which were transformative and deeply moving. And I'll highlight some of those as I go through the slide uh, presentation. It's not a ton of slides. Um, extensive slide presentations bore me to death, particularly when I'm doing them. So this should be lean and mean, uh, and I hope it offers some information that's helpful to everybody. So let's go through that now, see what we can, we can discover. Okay, um, so I thought it was good to begin here um, with this image. There's some symbiology in this discussion that will be important in terms of understanding or arriving at a conceptual understanding of what the elements of the design mean and why, were the, why they were selected. The first is this whole concept of the door. Uh, this image was taken at Elmina Slave Fortress in Elmina, uh, Ghana on the coast. Elmina Castle is the, um, it's the oldest European structure south of the Sahara Desert built on the continent of Africa. It was initially not uh, intended to be a slave trading for fortress, but um, like many of the castles along the western coast of, um, of Africa, it was retrofitted uh, to serve the slave trade as the trading in human flesh became big business. So this is me looking through the door of no return. Uh, there are a couple of quotes here from Abdul Baha, um, Abdul Baha being the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the faith. Uh, who was the appointed head of the faith after the passing of um, Baha'u'llah, who Baha'is also call uh, the blessed perfection, um, you know, uh, the most glorious, those sorts of things. Um, but this quote uh, from Abdul Baha about, which is attributed to Abdul Baha about Robert Turner uh, on the left hand side here, my left, which says, if thou remain firm and fast until the end, you will be a door through which a whole race will enter the kingdom. So Abdu'l-Baha um, recognizing the significance of Robert Turner's embrace of the Baha'i faith in uh, the summer of 1898. And um, after be, being informed of his, his embrace, um, you know, um, saying these words uh, that he has a role, a definite role to play in the destiny uh, of the human family and particularly of people of African descent. The image down here, uh, this is a Sankofa symbol uh, Sankofa, uh, Sankofa symbols are, um, are part of the Adinkra uh, pantheon of symbols. Adinkra comes from West Africa, particular from uh, Ghana, um, and it's a pantheon of symbols uh, that have different uh, meanings. This one here, Sankofa, means to go back and look at the past in order to understand where you are so you can have a clear vision of where you are going. So in some sense, this symbol uh, collapses time. It links the past, the present, and the future. And in the Western, in, in Western educational, um, in the Western educational system, in the Western understanding of reality, there's this notion of time as existing linearly on a continuum, right? It's just, it go, you start at, the, start at the beginning and then you proceed towards the end, wherever that is. Within the context of African cosmology, African understanding of reality, time is on a continuum, it's circular, right? The present is bound to the past, the, pa the past is bound to the future. So one is constantly traveling in this kind of circular um, formation. So uh, just keep that in mind, that's an important element for the design as well. Uh, the quote on the right, gracious God, what a shining candle was lighted within that black colored lamp. Praise be to God that this candle ascended from its earthly lamp unto the immortal kingdom to gleam and shine in the assemblage of heaven from Abdu'l-Baha. The first quote is attributed to Abdu'l-Baha, so someone uh, heard Abdu'l-Baha say this. The other quote is authoritative, the second quote. Um, he actually wrote this down. So just wanna make sure you have that distinction. Uh, and again, the quote that I just read, the one on the right, uh, this one here, uh, this refers to the character of Robert Turner. So, um, you know, Abdul Baha, as he was wont to do, he employs these metaphors, these allegories um, to talk about, to provide a, a kind of context for us to understand spiritual reality. And here he's using the concept of the black colored lamp and the personage of the black skin of Robert Turner and talking about the shining candle that is within him, the light that is, is within him. 
So um, quite a remarkable statement and one of my, um, my favorites uh, in terms of the life of Robert Turner. Okay. So let's look at uh, some um, life highlights uh, of Robert Turner. Uh, Robert Turner, he's born in and around 1856 in Portsmouth, Virginia. The map uh, below these images is of Virginia. He's born to an enslaved woman. Of course, we say enslaved rather than a slave, right? Because if we say a slave, that is a state of being where if we say a person is enslaved, you know, the difference between an imposed condition, a state of being, you know, um, a social a social station. So we say enslaved, born to an enslaved woman, Miss Emily Wilson. In 1857, uh, 1856, excuse me, the sparks of the coming civil war are beginning to burn. Some of those are things like the Dred Scott uh, case of 1856. Um, Dred Scott, an enslaved uh, person, brought a case uh, to the Supreme Court uh, in which he was trying to uh, gain his freedom. Um, uh, the Chief Justice Robert B. Taney, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in his decision where they ruled against Dred Scott, uh, says that um, he said that, um, uh, that black people were inferior to white people and so far inferior that the white, that the black man had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. So the Dred Scott case becomes a seminal, ca seminal case in 1856, helps to um, incite passions um, in the anti-slavery movement, uh, and also helps to foment uh, the already heated passions of those who were pro-slavery, leading all of this leading up to the Civil War. Uh, Anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces clash in a series of battles uh, referred to as Bleeding Kansas. Uh, one of those, John Brown, uh, who was uh, adamant, uh, vehement, and, um, and uh, just uh, the, at, the, at the head of, uh, of the violent wing of the uh, anti-slavery movement. By violence, I mean that he, he saw that, um, based on his analysis, he didn't see that violence was a problem in terms of putting down um, slavery. He would quote the Bible quite often to talk about the wrath of God and that violence uh, used to put down, um, to end slavery was a justifiable means for such a brutal system. And you had people that came down on either sides of his analysis. Uh, Frederick Douglass at this time is around 38 years old. Of course, we all know who Frederick Douglass was. He is perhaps considered the greatest orator of the, um, of the uh, 19th century. Um, an extraordinary human being who was born into slavery, uh, who subsequently um, steals away to his own freedom. Um, he escaped uh, slavery. Uh, he learns to read and write uh, while he is enslaved in the home of a family in Maryland, which of course was something that could get you killed during that time. And he uh, helps to push President Lincoln um, towards drafting the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, historical analysis has revealed over the years that had there not been a Frederick Douglass, it is very unlikely that Lincoln ever would have drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. So we cannot forget the importance of the powerful oratory and character of someone like Frederick Douglass who combined this, this deep uh, kind of intellectual and spiritual um, depth that comes out of his experience of enslavement and his desire to want to better his station, his, um, his, uh, the unusual right circumstances that allowed him to learn to read and write and his determination in his own words to free first himself and then if possible to free all of Negroes, right? Which is what we were called uh, amongst other things during that period. So Frederick Douglass is around 38 years old. Um, he's out preaching against uh, slavery uh, across the country, eventually travels uh, to Europe and uh, other places. Uh, a couple of uh, important events. Um, Robert Turner's born kind of in the middle, in, in between two uh, uh, revelations of God. So within the Baha'i context, uh, Baha'is, we believe that this is the first time in human history that you have had twin manifestations of God. By manifestations of God, I mean uh, prophet founders of a new revelation. Um, manifestation of God being, uh, if we don't talk about metaphor and allegory, like a mirror. And the virtues, the characteristics of God are manifest within that mirror perfectly. And then that mirror also reflects those things to the human family, right? and through revelation, through the teachings of revelation, brings humanity from its current stage of development to a new level of development because the teachings are new. 
they allow us to uh, mature as a human family. So 1844 marks the dawn of the Babi revelation. That's the revelation that precedes the Baha'i revelation, which in 1863, that marks the dawn of the Baha'i revelation through the founder, prophet, teacher, Baha'u'llah, otherwise known as the glory of God. So Robert Turner, born in 1856, in some sense, is born in between these two uh, revelations, which is a time full of spiritual import and um, the fulfillment of, 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 prophet, of prophecy, um, prophetic teaching. And so he's born in this fertile soil um, in between those two revelations. All right. So um, this, the image on the left uh, was taken at uh, Cape Coast Slave Castle. Um, just a few months ago, I was there um, in December. I spent five days in Ghana. And um, this is one of the dungeons. Uh, I wanted to show this image because Turner, his life and his story cannot be understood without the experience of enslavement, right? And of course, Turner is not born in Africa. He's born in the States, right? He's the son of, of perhaps individuals who were born on the continent of Africa, and then because of the Middle Passage, right, were transported to the United States. So this is one of the dungeons in Cape Coast Castle. Um, they have the lights on here because if they turn the lights off, you can't really see your hand in front of you. It's that dark in this space. And if you look at the ground here um, on the floor, there's kind of like a crusted surface that looks like it could be some kind of glaze. Well. What's interesting about that is that that's actually not a glaze. Um, that's not an artificial glaze. That actually is human DNA, excrement, um, vomit, blood, um, um, all manner of, uh, of, of the remnants of human beings being packed into this space over centuries. And this is the evidence um, that these souls, these individuals existed, that they were here. Um, so. Baha'u'llah explicitly in his revelation forbids trafficking and slavery. He says it is forbidden you to trade in slaves, be they men or women. It is not for him who is himself a servant to buy another's, another of God's servants. And this have been prohibited in his holy tablet. Thus by his mercy hath the commandment been recorded by the pen of justice. Let no man exalt himself above another. All are but bond slaves before the Lord and all exemplify the truth that there is none of the God but him. Okay, a few more examples or, or a few more highlights of Robert Turner's life. Uh, in the 1870s, following the end of the Civil War in 1865, Robert Turner, he moves west to California. Um, he finds work as a waiter at the palace, one of San Francisco's finest hotels. The hotel only hired black servers. Now it's important to understand the social context during this time. Uh, many places uh, would only take black servers. Uh, my, um, I have a great grandfather um, who is from St. Croix, Ashley Totten, who helped to found the Pullman Porters. Pullman Porters was the first black union in the United States. And Pullman Porters were um, gentlemen who rode the rails, right, between cities. And what they would do is they would port the bags, most often of white clientele, and they would get, you know, a few coins here and there. It was a very difficult job, um, but they only employed black workers to do that work. There was in the consciousness of white America, um, this framework of blackness um, wedged between um, these uh, polarities of servitude and slavery. You know, servitude in the in the context existing, you know, um, outside or after slavery, right? A servitude that, in a way, was imposed upon Black people because of the limited opportunities. But because in, in the consciousness of white America, it was difficult for many whites not to see Black people outside of that framework of servitude, right? So the options for people to earn a living are limited. So Robert Turner, one of the few things that he could do was to work as a servant in order to make enough money to feed himself, to put clothes on his back, and that's what he did. So he begins working at this hotel. In 1881, 
uh, he begins working as a butler for David S. Brown, somebody who uh, came into the hotel frequently. He was the owner of a um, safe company, um, a fireproof safe company. Sometime in or around 1883, as a young man in his mid-20s, Robert Turner left David S. Brown's employment and went to work for the wealthy mining and real estate magnate George Hearst, initially as a waiter, but soon as the Hearst family butler. He worked for the family for 26 years. A lot of people claim that the best movie made um, in all of all time was Citizen Kane. Um, Citizen Kane tells the story of a wealthy newspaper magnate. Well, the inspiration for that movie, that family was the Hearst family. So um, these are very important people socially. They have a lot of money. And Robert Turner winds up um, working for these people again as a servant. But he's not just a servant. One cannot underestimate um, the important station that he occupied in the Hertz family estate. Um, his character, um, his work ethic, um, his ability to get things done really meant that increasingly he bore more and more responsibility in terms of managing the household, right? In terms of managing the affairs across the estate. So he held a very important position uh, in the Hertz family. When Senator Hearst, and he did become a United States Senator, passed away at the age of 71, his widow, Phoebe Hearst, who was then 48 years old, I guess he liked him young, retained uh, Robert Turner as a personal butler. In 1898, Mrs. Hearst begins encounters, uh, she encounters the Baha'i faith uh, through Lua Getzinger, who was a prominent uh, early American um, Baha'i. Um, they, uh, they would have conversations in one of the, um, of beautiful parlors in the home. And uh, Robert Turner, of course, going about his duties, he would be serving and he would also be listening. Um, something needs to be said about this quality of listening within the black community. It's quite interesting. This listening is not passive, it's active, right? Uh, but black people, because of our social position um, through the transatlantic slave trade, through slavery here in the States, right? We were um, invisible in many sense to the white community, other than uh, as servants, right? What we put on the table, how much cotton we picked, uh, how much sugar cane we cut, other than what the money that we put in the pocket, right? Of the slave owner, we were invisible. That invisibility, though dehumanizing, and demeaning also was an opportunity because it allowed us to move through spaces and to develop that quality of listening. And also that ability to see deeply, right? Into uh, the complexities of human experience. And that ability to see, right? Becomes very, very important as a metaphor, right? When referring to black people within a context of the Baha'i faith. So invisibility to provide us an opportunity to examine and get to know the white community. While the white community saw us as invisible, they did not see us. So they didn't know us, but we knew them. It's very important to keep that in mind. So Robert Turner is listening. He's practicing a very old active modality of survival within the black community. And as he's listening to these two women have this conversation, he's learning about the Baha'i faith. That combined with his deep penetrating spiritual insight, right, which Baha'u'llah will refer, which Abdu'l-Baha will refer to later on, right, allows him to recognize the truth of Baha'u'llah's teachings, which center on the oneness of mankind. And for somebody born in enslavement, that must have been a profound, profound teaching for him to encounter and to um, recognize. So he must have been, something in his soul must have been waiting to hear that teaching, and he responds to it, okay? In the summer of 1898, Robert Turner and also Mrs. Hearst embrace the Baha'i faith. Okay, this is a picture of Abdul Baha, um, the son of the prophet founder Baha'u'llah. Um, Abdul Baha is referred to as the master in the Baha'i community. Uh, master because um, we believe that he mastered what it was to live a Baha'i life, right? Um, Abdul Baha, in many ways, represents uh, the integration, right, of the duality of a human being, someone who is subject to all of the infirmities, all of the difficulties of existing within a human body. But then you also combine that 
with what uh, Shogi Effendi, um, the guardian of the Baha'i faith says, superhuman knowledge and perfection. Those two realities, according to the Baha'i teachings, have been blended and harmonized within the personage of Abdul Baha. So he is the master. He's the one that we look to in terms of trying to model our lives after as we're walking this very difficult, uh, very um, wonderful, but also very difficult path of living a Baha'i life. So there exists initially as, um, as you know, Abdul Baha learns of Robert Turner's um, uh, embrace of the faith. And there's no official correspondence that exists um, between Abdul Baha that anybody's been able to find and Robert Turner. Um, however, um, an early American Baha'i Sarah Farmer may have sent Robert's photograph to Abdul Baha. And in a subsequent tablet written to Turner, Abdul Baha compared the dark color of Robert Turner's skin to a fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world and to the pupil of the eye. So the pupil of the eye is what gives the eye the capacity to see, yes? Without the pupil, you can't see. There's no, you're blinded. So the pupil is that apparatus, right? That allows sight to enter the eye. Yes, and then the whiteness around the eye, the sclera actually protects and reinforces the pupil. So here you have this duality, this, um, uh, th this uh, interrelationship between the white and the black. And the Baha'i teachings teach us that there is a relationship between the spiritual and the physical world, right? That those two things are related and that the one symbolizes or holds secrets that points to the other. So this relationship between the black and the white, one can say that's the black and the white race, right? Again, we know that race, right, is a social construct. It does not exist. But in order to understand and perhaps to provide some context, we're going to use these old modalities, which increasingly don't serve us, but in order for us to arrive at some understanding. But the black and the white, right, this interplay of those two, sight coming in through the blackness of the eye, and then the white reinforcing it, protecting it, this interrelationship between the two. So. Abdul Baha, looking at uh, Robert Turner's dark colored skin, I can only imagine the master must have been overjoyed that the first um, African American believer had embraced the cause of Baha'u'llah. And he comments um, in this uh, tablet, he says, oh thou who art pure in heart, sanctified in spirit, peerless in character, beauteous in face, thy photograph have been received revealing thy physical frame in the utmost grace and best appearance. Thou art dark in countenance and bright in character. Thou art light unto the pupil of the eye, which is dark in color, yet it is the fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world, right? So thou art dark in countenance and bright in colors. Interesting, there's a link, that word and, right? He doesn't say thou art dark in countenance, but bright in character. The but would signify that the darkness, right, is somehow a handicap. He says thou art dark in countenance and bright in character, right? It's a subtle thing, but very powerful. A lot of import there. So again, this... This statement about his quality, right, his character, the light that shines forth from his soul, the ability to see, yes? All right, let's, there we go. Oh, sorry, guys. There we go. Okay. All right. So this unique Baha'i metaphor for the pupil of the eye, which compares people of African descent to the optical portal of light that gives us all vision, has since become a much beloved descriptive phrase among the millions of Baha'is worldwide and a signifier of the vitally important role those with African heritage play in the Baha'i vision of racial unity. Now, why is this statement so vitally important? I'm gonna give you a, 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 a personal antidote, and then I'd like to pull out and, and maybe address it in a larger context. Growing up, um, experiencing racism as a very young boy, getting into fights um, about um, over the color of my skin, um, uh, derogatory things that were said about me um, or members of my family or other people in the community. Um, I always felt that I was in this struggle 
right? This internal struggle with the way that the world perceived me, yes? And with the way that I was trying to perceive myself, right? And whether you like it or not, because all of us would like to claim that we're super strong and that, you know, uh, words and phrases don't hurt us, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Of course, in some sense, that's a fiction, right? Right? Because if you grow up with a constant and continuous barragement, right, of disparaging words, of subtle, right, um, uh, dehumanizing um, gestures or behaviors, some of that stuff does eventually seep into your consciousness and it begins to impact you. And without an ecosystem around you that can lift you up, Right. In spite of all of that, it's very difficult to maintain a healthy sense of self. So in some sense, those who exist at the margins, in particular black and brown people, black and brown children are fighting an uphill battle. Right. So when I came encounter, when I've been a bit of behind now since 1992, so a little while, when I came encounter with this, this teaching about the pupil of the eye and the fact that it was coming from a revelation of God, from the teachings of a new world religion. And it was so specifically addressed to people of African descent. That did something to my spirit. That lifted me. That gave me a new context, a new framework, how to perceive myself, how to think about myself, right? Because it was coming from a revelation from God. And as much as I love, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Maya Angelou, Harriet Tubman, the list of great leaders goes on and on who happen to present as black people, right? A revelation from God is larger and grander still even than those exalted personages. So to hear it from a revelation of God has a different kind of import. There's a weight, a heft to that that has the ability over time as we begin to internalize that reality to lift us and give us a new understanding of who we are. And he's not just saying it to black people, he's saying it to the world, right? Abdu'l-Bahá is saying that you better wake up because there are qualities in these people, particularly their ability to see, to perceive both the objective and the subjective reality that is essential to the forward advancement of the human family. And if you don't catch on, you don't support, encourage, right? You're gonna be walking into the future in some sense blind. Yes, people of the eye. Okay, this is a photographic image of the first group of Western pilgrims to visit the Holy Land uh, in 1898. Um, this includes uh, Phoebe Hurst is here. I think this is Phoebe Hurst here, if I'm not mistaken. It's either one of these two women, I can't remember, uh, and her niece, um, other members of the pilgrimage group. I don't have to, I don't think I have to point out Robert Turner to you. If I do, we need to have a conversation offline. Another time we can do that. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, this is in 1898. Um, and Robert Turner did encounter Abdul Baha during this time. Uh, the story goes um, by um, one of the most preeminent uh, African American believers, a man named Louis Gregory. Um, said that Robert Turner fell on his face uh, before Abdu'l-Bahá and said that he was not worthy uh, to be in his presence. And Abdu'l-Bahá lifted him up lovingly and embraced him uh, as a son. So um, subsequent uh, kind of transformations in Robert Turner um, um, that, uh, you know, that affected him in a very deep way and people could see in him was that he said, after he had met Abdu'l-Bahá, he's reported to have said, never again will I allow the world to kick dust in my face. So whatever it was about that encounter with the personage of Abdu'l-Bahá, and I can go into the many qualities that make Abdu'l-Bahá truly unusual. Um, you know, he's called the limb of the law of God, the being around whom all names revolve, the inside of the most great peace, the moon of the central orb of this most holy dispensation. In other words, the brother was bad. He was a bad dude. Um, and I'm not talking about bad in, in, in the ways that we consider bad to be in contemporary society, many, many of us. Flashing, cars, all that kind of stuff. The brother was bad morally, internally. Yes, there was an internal, um, a deep sense of spiritual awareness, spiritual insight 
the ability to translate that awareness and that insight into human action to provide the persons that he encountered, be they men, women, black, white, red, doesn't matter, with just the thing that they needed at the moment that set him apart. That's Abdul Baha. Many people who encountered him talked about this radiant light that they felt in him, this incredible embrace and love that lifted them to a new level of awareness, a new spiritual reality that they had never experienced before. That's who he was. So Robert Turner, impacted by that encounter with Abdul Baha, transformed, right? By that teaching about the pupil of the eye, but also had personal encounter and is affirming after that encounter that never again is he gonna allow the world to kick dust in his face. A man born into slavery, spends his life serving others because of his limited opportunities. That's what he knew how to do. I'm sure had been demeaned, degraded, dehumanized more times than he can count. And he's saying, never again will I allow the world to kick dust in my face. Completely transformed through that encounter with Abdul Baha, through his study of the writings of Baha'u'llah, through that teaching of the oneness of mankind, the unity of the human family, but not a unity based on saneness, a unity based on diversity that respects and honors our cultural differences, that respects and honors the various ways that we perceive and have experienced the world, right? And views humanity as a great garden of flowers, right? The colors may differ, but that variety, that diversity creates this incredible bouquet, you know, of, of colors and difference, right? That beautifies the whole, so. Okay, so um, that's most of the highlights I'm gonna share about Robert Turner's um, life. If you wanna go into more detail, you can um, go to the Robert Turner uh, Monument website. You can read this, uh, more of the details about his life uh, for yourself. Incidentally, um, the incredible work uh, in terms of uh, writing um, uh, these highlights on the website were done by incredible people, uh, Dr. Derek Smith, David Langris, um, others who really collaborated to create, um, um, you know, this this incredible biography, um, biographical sketch of the life of Robert Turner. So let's go to um, the monument. So I was approached. Um, I guess it's about oh I can't remember maybe two years ago. Um, two and a half years ago, um, to be part of a, um, of a team that would uh, work to design the memorial for Robert Turner. Um, an incredible group of people, there are nine of us um, from different walks of life. Uh, each one of us had a different skill set um, that was important to the, uh, to the goals and the functioning of the group as a whole and to the reaching of the goal of really creating a hopefully a, a monument that would impact the community and become a silent witness and a silent teacher of, um, of Baha'u'llah's messages revelation. And um, I, um, we consulted and, and, and um, you know, as an artist, as a creative person um, who thinks visually, um, we consulted and my role was uh, to be, uh, to serve as the designer. Um, I'd never really done um, uh, outside like uh, a monument design. It wasn't my skill set. It wasn't uh, what I had trained to do. Um, but I also felt there were a few things that I felt very strongly about this, this process. First of all, um, Robert Turner being the first African-American believer, I felt then and I felt very strongly now that the person um, tapped to design that monument needed to be a person of African descent. I say that emphatically um, and without hesitation because the faith, the Baha'i faith, um, the fundamental um, teaching in our faith is the oneness of mankind, unity and diversity. And the constant refrain, right? Or the constant question that all Baha'is around the world are constantly having to ask ourselves, right? It's part of our spiritual mandate, yes? Is who is missing at the table? Who is not present in this aspect of Baha'i life, Baha'i activity, 
in, 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 in world life, out, even outside of the Baha'i community, who is missing from the table. So I felt very strongly that a person of African descent needed to do this work. Also, I felt it needed to be someone that understood, right, that their proximity to the reality of Mr. Turner's life, right, could be experienced within, you know, that experience, right? Not outside, not only outside looking in, but because of his, the particularities of his life journey, being a person of African descent, living here in the United States, it needed to be someone that could enter that space and understand it intimately. I thought that was very significant and very important in order to come up with something that perhaps um, could be moving. Um, so, um, so, so that's, so, so with that in mind, um, I, um, I uh, agreed to participate in this process. Um, let me say, you know, I have to be, I must be honest. Um, it was not easy. Um, there were, there are a lot of challenges when you get people together from different backgrounds, um, different skill sets, different personalities. Um, there's a lot of challenges that you have to go through. For those of you who may be attending, this may be your first um, Baha'i gathering. Um, this may be your second or your third. I'm not a person that likes to paint a Pollyannish view of the Baha'i community. We're not perfect. The revelation, the teachings are perfect. But what I tell everybody unequivocally is that this is not a paradise, this is a workhouse. And that our daily task as Baha'is is to get up day in and day out. We may fail sometimes, other people may fail. We may get on somebody's nerves, they may get on our nerves. But the task is to get up and continue the work, to forgive myself, to forgive others, and then to join hand in hand to continue the work. Because the ultimate goal and destiny, the oneness of mankind, is bigger than my personality failings, the failings of my brothers or my sisters, right? So with that spirit, right, with that dedication, that devotion, that's how we entered into this work. The Baha'i Faith also says that through the clash of differing opinions, the spark of truth comes forth, right? Or it's revealed, right? That idea of clash, right? Not in a violent way, but it's a metaphor, it's an allegory, right? That clashing, right? Presenting of one's perspectives, one ideas, right? And then entering into a good faith debate Right, not a debate about power or you know, or clinging to my own notion as being my own, and I want to see that put forward. But this is how I see it. This is my understanding. Now let's enter into a contest of ideas that is rooted in love and injustice. Right, where that once I present the idea to the group, it is no longer my own. It belongs, in some sense, to the group. Yes. So we entered into this into this work you know, laboring, struggling with ourselves, struggling with each other. And um, that was the process as we uh, maneuvered um, through this experience. So a few things I started thinking about um, initially, um, conceptually, as I began to think about the design. And I do this with everything. I begin research, um, looking at some of the examples of the life of the person. Um, how can I translate that that life through physical form, through metaphor and allegory into a visual experience, right? Um, in physical form that will speak to the qualities of that person and touch the person who's interacting with that object in a deep way that they feel like there's something deeply resonant, something deeply meaningful that they're experiencing as they're interacting um, with this object. So I started thinking about the quotes from Abdul Baha about the character and the quality of Robert Turner. I started thinking about um, that incredible quote attributed to Abdul Baha about him being a door, right? Through which an entire race will enter the kingdom of heaven. I started thinking about um, the qualities of, you know, that black colored lamp with that candle being lit within him. Um, I thought about material relationships, right? What materials will speak to, on the one hand, his humility, the humble position that he occupied in, uh, in the social hierarchy, being a servant. 
but also spoke to something expansive about his soul and also about the inherent dignity, the deep dignity, the dignified manner of this man and um, his qualities of character that uh, Baha'u'llah thought so, that Abdu'l-Baha thought so highly of um, to speak about in tablets. Um, so I, I was thinking about these things and that's a difficult thing to, to um, try to resolve, right? How does material on the one hand speak about humility, but also about uh, a kind of expansiveness, um, you know, of the, the expansiveness of the character of the person, the person who was occupied a low social state, but nevertheless in the spiritual realm was a giant. And that was the reality of Robert Turner's life. So um, let's see, let's go into, I'll read you a little bit of the concept and then we'll look at some of the uh, imagery. Conceptual synopsis. Um, by me. <laughs> In conceiving a reimagining of the Robert Turner gravesite, I drew on three central thematic elements from the life of Mr. Turner, the first African American Baha'i, which link him to the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the prophet and founder of the Baha'i faith. These elements form the conceptual framework for the design process. One, the first was the station of servitude a social constraint imposed on enslaved black Americans, one that defined the life of Robert Turner, who was born into slavery in 1856 and subsequently worked as a domestic servant after the Civil War until his death in 1909. The sustained subjugation maintained via the brutal apparatus of the slavery system and the racist social practices that constrained the ambitions of black Americans demanded an affectation of self-deprecation to reinforce the mythology of racial superiority. Mr. Turner was forced to dwell within the absurdity of this perverse reality. The irony is that in the context of the Baha'i faith, the station of servitude is held as the apogee of human achievement. But in this case, it is a choice. Service to humanity as a central pillar of one's faith is a conscious act of volition motivated by love, not by violent coercion. Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah and his appointed successor held that quote, servitude to the entire human race, end of quote, was his quote, perpetual religion, end of quote. By elevating this humble posture above worldly ambition, Abdu'l-Baha, who was a contemporary of Mr. Turner's, asserts a spiritual solidarity with those whose lives have been defined by their service to others, a profound reordering of the social structure, particularly for those forced into slavery's coffle. The second is the spiritual concept of the pupil of the eye, we went through some of that. I don't need to, to go too much into that. Um, finally, it's said that Mr. Turner was assured by Abdu'l-Baha that if he stayed faithful, he would be the door, correct? We kind of went into that as well. Each of these thematic elements have informed the various stages of the design process from the overall look of the initial drawings, the selection of materials, which to my mind are essential to capturing the vital force of Mr. Turner's spirit. I offer this work as a humble gift to the Black American Baha'i community, to the Baha'i community at large, and to humanity. Okay. Um, let's, okay, so let's look at some of this. So initially, um, this is really the, 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 the final rendering of, of the design. Um, it, had, it went through some different permutations as designs do when you're working through it. Um, some of the things what I initially came up with actually could not be realized. The engineering complications were a little bit um, tricky. So um, what we settled on was this um, rough cut piece of stone, a huge piece of stone um, with this large void or circle cut into it. Again, uh, the circle here is symbolic and it's important. Um, the whole concept, the African concept of time the past being linked to the present and also to the future. So not linearly, but in this kind of continuum, right? And then this idea of this door being set um, as though it's a jar to the right of it with the image of Mr. Turner 
and uh, his name, disciple of Abdul Baha, and the dates that he uh, lived uh, on the door. Uh, to the left here is, uh, you can't really see it here, but it's the quote about him being a door through which a whole race would enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the burial marker that rests in front of the design. Um, I chose this shape because it's widely considered to be the universal symbol for the soul. It also has a close relationship to the shape of a boat, which in a conceptual sense references the transatlantic slave trade. And there are two symbols here on the top end, on the crown, and also on the, on the bottom end. The one is the nine-pointed Baha'i star, um, which is the Baha'i symbol. And on the bottom is the Sankofa symbol, go back to your past to understand so you can know where you're going in the future. Um, and then there's the quote from Abdul Baha about the character uh, inscribed on the burial marker. Uh, these are done, uh, initially this was going to be done in Cortin steel, which is why you get this rust color here, but it was subsequently changed to bronze. Um, and the burial marker is also in bronze uh, as well. Here on the ground, you have a bronze plaque with the other individuals who are buried, buried on this plot. Um, this plot is in Cypress, um, Cypress Lawn Cemetery, which is near San Francisco um, in California. Of course, uh, that's the area where Mr. Turner um, worked and um, uh, lived out um, uh, the greater portion of his life. Okay, so let's go to um, some images. All right, so a rough, these, these are just the composition, a rough cut basalt superstructure with a, lot, with a large circle, approximately three feet in diameter, cut through the stone. Um, it was amazing to watch them cut that. Although I wasn't there, I saw somebody did a video for me, which was uh, amazing to watch. Cast bronze door depicting the image of Robert Turner affixed to the surface of the superstructure. Finally, the dark bronze burial marker fabricated in the shape of the universal symbol for the soul. It distends like a womb rising from the earth across the body of the form is a quote by Abdul Baha. We talked about that. Um, so these are some of the um, uh, final elements. You see the burial marker here with the names of the other people who are interred here, member, members of Robert Turner's family. Um, you see the, the left-hand bottom of the stone base with the quote, if thou remain firm and steadfast until the end, you'll be a door through which an entire race will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, some of the images of the finished design. Again, you have this cast bronze um, burial marker here. Uh, let's, we can actually, let's do this. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Uh, so again, you see this, you see how thick uh, that stone is and they had the, the, the blade that they had cutting through that and they had to do it at very slow, slow times and it's hydraulic, a hydraulic blade. So it, the water is fed through it to keep the blade from overheating and possibly melting. It's a really uh, interesting process to watch. The names of the people who interred with Mr. Turner. This is a rear view of the uh, stone um, superstructure. Um, it's big enough for people to walk through. I left it open like that because uh, I thought that was important because people can actually have the experience of walking through the symbolic door of Mr. Turner's life and being um, born into a new reality. When I was in um, West Africa, I went into a Tinme village. Tinme are one of the largest tribal groups um, in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is my ancestral homeland. Um, on my mother's side, we are Mende. Mende is the second largest tribal group in Sierra Leone. And part of our um, travels through Sierra Leone were to go into the villages and those who were descendants uh, of the Timne, uh, the Mende and the Limba peoples, depending on what village um, we went into, we participated in naming ceremonies where we got our African names from the elders in the village. So I went into the Timne, I'm not Timne, but I went to support my brothers and sisters. Um, and I was honored to be, to be able to witness uh, the male portion of the naming ceremony. And what they do is they, they, they go into a clearing in the woods, they have constructed this thatched wall, which is probably roughly about 15 feet um, wide and maybe 10 feet tall. Within the middle of the wall, there's a hole and as a person is being named, they are passed through the hole of the wall and they come out on the other side. And then the elder whispers their new name in their ear. And then they come back, they're passed back through the wall, reborn. I didn't know that when I designed this piece, but there is some um, 
there's some synchronicity there, right? Some conceptual, conceptual synchronicity. And I just think it's really a, a beautiful um, kind of alignment, this whole idea of being reborn, um, passing um, from, on the one sense, passing from a time when you didn't know about the latest revelation from God, and then embracing that truth and reality, right? Based on your own investigation, your own diligent search for truth, right? Which is a responsibility of being a mature adult. We have to search for the truth ourselves, right? And then determine whether it's true or false and then embrace it if we find it to be true. Once I embrace that knowledge passing through this portal where I am born anew with these new teachings that move humanity from a certain stage in our development to a new stage, right? That help us to grow up as a human family because of these new teachings, the oneness of mankind, the equality of women and men, uh, the harmony of science, religion, independent investigation of truth for oneself, right? Some of the core teachings of the Baha'i faith. So with this new revelation being born anew, right? Like a baptism. So superstructure, this whole cut out one passing from one plane of existence into the next. Uh, front side, you can see um, again, um, the door with the image, uh, the cast bronze door with the image of um, Robert Turner. Just close up of that. Maybe that's it. Let me get out of here and see. I thought we had another. Oh, we do. Okay. I guess you can't zoom in on this one though. But again, another shot of that. You can see down here the Sankofa symbol. So another shot of that. And I don't know who that guy is. That's not important. So anyway, um, so that I'm going to get out of this. And um, so I can see some of these beautiful faces. Um, so anyway, so that's that's just a brief overview of um, how that process, how we kind of went through that process, how we came to um, the final design. And all of this was done um, um, collaboratively through consultation. We didn't proceed on anything without consultation. Consultation is a word you'll hear in the Baha'i faith all the time. Basically all it means is we talking to each other, right? we're engaged in conversation about important subject matter. Just a fancy way of saying we have a conversation about stuff that's important, okay? So your whole consultation, it's a, it's a, a popular phrase you hear all the time in the bi community, but it really is at the core of our community life, right? In terms of making decisions, in terms of deciding um, whether or not we're gonna go this way or go that way, right? And everybody has an equal say at the table. There are no hierarchies. There's no clergy in the Baha'i faith. When I was at Morehouse, I thought I was going to be a priest, believe it or not. I was going to be an Episcopalian priest. I know a lot of people can't believe that. I kind of can't believe it, but yes, I was. Um, and when I found out that the Baha'i community didn't have any priests, I was like, yo, man, I, um, that kind of changes my life. <laughs> but really the beauty of it, it, it's surprising, but the beauty of it is that in some sense, we're all ambassadors of the Baha'i faith, right? Once you become a Baha'i, your voice is as equal as the next person's. There's no hierarchy of clergy or anything like that, right? So um, there's a level that, that's beautiful in one sense. It also is daunting in another because there's a level of responsibility that one assumes. Um, and uh, consultation is a way that that's expressed, that equality is expressed within the community. So uh, I know I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna shut up, man. I really wanna get into some conversation because for me, that's where, the learning really happens. And I'm just excited to talk to some of these um, these beautiful people on here, man. Y'all look good, man. <laughs> Y'all look really good. So let, let's, let's talk, let's have some conversation. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, and it was, obviously I didn't know much of that history and then the things you shared in the end were um, really fascinating. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, the first question is, I'm fascinated by the symbol of the soul. I haven't seen that before. Can you talk briefly about the origins and context, please? It looks like, a, it, well, symbols are interesting because they mean, they, they have, in some sense, a specific meaning when they were created, but then that expands depending on who looks at it and what they see in it. And then that meaning can become associated as well. 
this, if you look at the symbol, looks similar to a fish. The fish is, uh, in many religions, is, um, is um, the symbol of the soul. But then if you expand on that, it also, again, looks like the boat, like a, the shape of a boat. It also has um, a loose association with the shape of an eye, which refers to the pupil of the eye, that whole thing of seeing again. So, um, so there's, in, in, in some sense, if one thinks about this even in a deeper way, there's also a relationship between the multiplicity of meanings embedded within the symbol of the burial marker and also the way that the African-American dialect and language has developed over time. And not only the African-American dialect, but dialect across the diaspora with double and triple meanings layered on top of each other, right? So what do I mean? When black Americans, um, when they were initially Africans transported to America, we had to find creative ways to survive within a hostile context. Language, sight, observation, listening became very important, right? So the technology, if you will, as Malcolm X would say, we embedded within our language, the way we use language, a kind of technology that allowed us to have multiple meanings while using the same phrase. So I could say, man, it's, it's sure is cool in here. I can say, yo, man, it's so cool in here. Same word, different meanings, right? So the same thing with symbiology, right? These multiple meanings that are reflected there. But that, that, um, that shape is generally associated with the shape of the fish, also which has deep meaning in the Christian faith as well because of, um, of, of Christ and the whole story with the fish. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is, I noticed he was married and had a daughter. Can you tell us about how he had a life with his family? Um, you know, he, I don't know, there's not a whole lot of detail about his life with his family. Um, we know that he did what he had to, to um, support his family, worked as a servant, that's what he did. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, that's, you know, we don't know, we don't have any like detailed sketches about what their marriage life was like. Um, he had a, they had a child, but their child died um, at a very young age. And which was a terrible blow to um, Robert Turner and his wife, um, deeply, deeply um, um, difficult to, to grapple and wrestle with. But um, yeah, that was the only child um, that they had. And um, unfortunately, um, didn't, um, died very young, so. Um, in Earl Redmond's book, Abdu'l-Bahá and Their Midst, it's mentioned that when he was in America, Robert Turner was ill, so Abdu'l-Bahá went to Robert Turner's home to visit him. Could you comment on this? I, you know, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I think that, I'm not sure about that. I'll have to read more into that. I'm not sure about that. Um, I know that uh, Abdu'l-Bahá um, comforted Robert Turner. Uh, there are uh, statements that he talked about um, where he comforted Robert Turner. He, he wrote him a letter where he was comforting him, telling him as he was getting ill, he was telling Robert Turner, you know, um, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing it because I haven't memorized the words, where he's essentially um, letting him know not to worry about this physical ailments, the, the, the physical frame, that the spiritual world, the greater world is waiting for him. And so we know that there's that kind of comforting um, uh, messaging from Abdu'l-Bahá to Robert Turner. But the specifics of that, I'm not sure. If somebody here has some details, I'd love to hear it, but I'm not so sure about that. Um, one question I had is like, what do you think is something important for us to take away from the legacy of Robert Turner? He's the first. I mean, he's, in some ways he symbolizes the courage the vision, um, the ability, um, the ability to uh, to become to stand at the vanguard, the ability to be um, to have the courage to embrace something that uh, was completely new, that hadn't existed in the world before. You know, many of us we practice religion, and I was raised this way initially you practice a religion or you arrive at your ideas based on a kind of, um, well, it's, a, it's, it's, it's passed down from generation to the next. 
if your parents were following a particular way of life, let's say they were, I don't know, let's say they're Buddhist and you grow up within a context of a Buddhist family, um, the chances that you wind up to be Buddhist are, you know, more than likely, right? It's very rare for us to encourage young people to encourage ourselves to really interrogate, you know, um, what the truth is. You know, it's much easier just to sit back on the understanding of somebody else. I got news for you. If you're if you're even remotely thinking about doing a deep investigation of the Baha'i faith and that troubles you, this probably ain't the space for you. Because this as a core tenet of our faith is independent investigation of the truth. There's a level of responsibility there that each person has um, to get up and do their own work. This is a revelation that does not tolerate people just sitting back um, because someone told them what to believe and they accept it. Truth has to be, has to have a certain, in order for it to be true, it has to be grounded in integrity. There has to be integrity and truth, the, the, the substance of reality, the truth of it, right? Is, 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 is um, emblematic, it's, it's the defining reality of what integrity is. Integrity is, without integrity, it's not really a truth, right? It's not based on anything real. So in order for us to say that my understanding of reality has integrity, I have to be willing to say that I have done the work, right? I have investigated this for myself. And for myself, I know this to be true for me. That's, you know, being responsible and being um, uh, somebody who's moving um, towards spiritual maturity. So. Thank you. Um, and someone commented that actually Abdul Baha had visited another uh, believer, Charles Tinsley. So not Robert thank Turner. You. I thought so. I thought that was, yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, could you please comment on Mr. Turner's time with Abdul Baha and the Holy Family in the Holy Land? Well, they, you know, they, uh, Abdul Baha was in Akka. He was in a pretty city, prison city of Akka. Um, he had been banished to the, to the prison city of Akka, where he was held there um, by the authorities. Um, Akka is uh, outside of Haifa, uh, Israel, where the Baha'i World Center is located. So he was under, he was under watchful, they were watching him. The authorities uh, had an eye on him. It's ironic though, because uh, Abdul Baha's character was so um, profoundly um, uh, transcendent and so, so strong that the prison guards who were watching him became attracted to his character. And um, they loosened a lot of the constraints that they had imposed upon him because of his character and who he was. So when the pilgrims, when that first group of pilgrims came to the prison city of Akka to spend time with Abdul Baha, because of the constraints of his uh, confinement there, they had to be broken up. I mean, the, the entire group couldn't go at one time to see Abdul Baha. So they um, broke up as a party. Now, the way the story goes is, is that the way that I understand it is that Abdul Baha was entertaining. He was having a meeting with some members of the pilgrim group. And um, Robert Turner was on the outside. He was outside of the room. And um, Abdul Baha went to greet Robert Turner. When Robert Turner saw Abdul Baha, he fell down on his knees and said, um, as, I, as I shared in the uh, slide presentation, uh, I'm not worthy essentially to be in your presence. And Abdul Baha lifted him up and embraced him um, as a son is, is, is how the story goes. So, um, and it was in that, in that subsequent meeting and also I'm sure in um, um, other audiences with Abdul Baha or around Abdul Baha, gradually I'm sure that that had such a profound impact on his soul. And uh, as a result of that, that's when you know, uh, subsequently he uttered those words, never again will I allow the world to kick dust in my face. This of course, from a man who was accustomed to the world kicking dust in his face. What was your personal arc of growth slash transition in the process of creating this monument? Hmm. Um, I think for me, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, Baha'i faith, we've been around since 1853. That's when Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the faith, who was imprisoned in the 
in, in the Black Pit, uh, which is one of the most notorious prisons in all of Iran, um, uttered his, uh, he proclaimed that he was the latest of God's messengers to humanity and proclaimed his mission to the world. It's 1863. This is the first time in our history, you know, the oneness of mankind is the preeminent principle in our faith, right? It is the one that we are striving to implement on a day-to-day -day basis celebrating the ways that the strides that we are making as a community, but also having the courage to be self-critical, to do a deep internal self-critique, right? Which is important for growth as well. This is the first time in our faith's history that we've had a monument designed by a person of African descent. Anything significant designed by a person of African descent. Now one could argue that there are a number of reasons why that is. Perhaps in the early 1900s, there weren't enough trained architects or artists who were of African descent who were nationally known, or I'm not nationally known, I'm regionally known, but who, who people knew enough about to tap their skill set. It's given. I also, I also think I can accept that in part, but I also think that my involvement in this project marks a growing awareness and maturity um, of the Baha'i community specifically, right? To, um, to just advance in terms of making sure that we have people sitting at the table who previously had been missing. So for me personally, engaged in this process, there was an affirmation, a sense that we were taking a step forward, right? That we were moving with intentionality to not only honor Robert Turner, but to also center an artist or creative person who happened to be somebody of African descent from the diaspora, right, in the design process. Yes. So there's a sense of there's a sense of, of affirmation, of confirmation, right? A validation of my belief in this revelation, the oneness of mankind, that I can see us taking a step forward in, in, in that space. Also, I'll say, I think the the the, the struggles. You know, as we struggled as a committee to work together, as a task force to work together, right, was great for me because, um, you know, that's how you learn, right, um, you know, what aspects of yourself, right, are working, what aspects you might need to look at and consider, what things you might need to tweak, how you're interacting with the group, how you may be perceiving how you're presenting yourself and how other people may be perceiving how you are presenting. And those two things may or may not line up. And so there's great learning in, in, in that process of consultation. This is, this is the thing about, you know, th this whole issue of the oneness of mankind and unity, right? A lot of people just want to come to this idea of unity and oneness without doing any work. As we say down in the deep south, that's a dog that don't hunt. It don't flow like that, right? We have to be willing to get down in the muck, the mud, the mire, and do the daily work, right? To stand in these spaces of discomfort and refuse to leave. Or if you do have to leave to catch your breath, always committed to coming back and picking up your hoe, whatever utensil you're using, whatever implement you're using and can make your contribution to this work. So that process of working with different personalities, people from different cultural groups, right? Is the critical work of building a future where the oneness of humanity is not a theoretical supposition, but is a living reality right? Where everybody has a place at the table. That's the work. And if we're not willing to do that work, I question our commitment to equality and justice. If I'm not willing to do the work, I question my own commitment. Yes. So for me, that's, that's, that's what was important. That's what I learned in the process. Thank you. Um, looks like we're at time. So I just want to thank you so much again on behalf of me and everyone here. Uh, we really enjoyed your talk today. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. All right, guys. Take care. Bye. <clears throat> Take care. And our, our speaker next week is Dr. Steve Wirth.
and his topic will be agriculture as the key to global prosperity of a high perspective. So I've put the link to our um, YouTube channel and our contact form in the chat. And we'll go ahead and end with a Baha'i prayer set to music. Oh my God, oh my God, unite. of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose may they fall Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Bye.